welcome to another episode of A Flat Pack History of Sweden. Hello, hi. We, uh, after much deliberation, we have decided to call this uh, episode The Not-So-Missing Iron Age. Yeah, we struggled trying to come up with a pun around <laughs> ironing, um, sort of ironing out the details or something. We, there, were, there were many suggestions, each worse than the previous one, and in the end, we've just gone for the not-so-missing Iron Age, because we thought this episode was going to be sort of not necessarily harder to make, but have less detail in it and perhaps be more boring yeah and i apologize i said at the end of the last episode that yeah this wouldn't as be as fun and would maybe be sort of a middle episode before we get to the vikings but it is actually really good it's because like always the iron age is split into more than one period and perhaps the first period is a bit boring but then the last two are actually really exciting yeah, so hopefully we should be able to rehabilitate the Iron Age's uh, reputation in this episode and prove that it is actually really interesting. Yeah, sounds good to me. So start with a Swedish phrase. Mm-hmm. This week's Swedish phrase is Åna ugglor i mossen. So something about a bog yeah, so and think, owls. <laughs> indeed. It, it translates to to suspect that there are owls in the bog. Okay. Like in in the bog or sort of like in the area of the no, bog? No, no, actually in the bog, okay. which is a place that owls don't normally hang out. No, so exactly. It means uh, to suspect that something isn't right, uh, that there's something off, something suspicious. In its use, it's similar to the English expression to smell a rat. Okay. So, hon gjorde allt för att ingen skulle ana ugglo i mossen. She did everything to... Make sure no one suspected anything. So perhaps what our murderers that we've looked at in other episodes, they've been trying to do that. Yeah, to not... Become get, suspicious. Become suspicion. Apparently, the etymology of it, in Denmark, there was an expression, der ulve i mossen, which means there's a wolf in the bog, meaning that a dangerous situation was looming. But then the wolves in Denmark died out and the owl sort of took the position of the wolf uh, because the words are relatively similar, maybe, uh, and became the symbol of a warning ahead of something dangerous and suspicious. Uh, and in Denmark, they still say, der ugla i mossen, just like in Swedish, there are owls in the bog. Nice. So if you hear a... Danish politician or something, or a Swedish politician giving a speech, and they've mm. said, Oh, and I didn't actually want to do uh, the thing because I thought there was an owl in the bog. You'd be sitting there thinking, What? But you, listener, will know what they're really trying yeah. to say. I would also like to apologize for Chris's mildly offensive imitation of what Scandinavians sometimes was, sound when a, they speak English. It was more of a Norwegian. It was accent. So I haven't mastered the Swedish person speaking know, English accent. Yeah. I know we have a tendency to go up and down in tone a lot when we speak English. This is usually how you sort of portray a Scandinavian speaking English, but it's a difficult language to learn. It's a bit Italian. <laughs> yeah, well, how about we stop doing accents uh, now and just dive in the Iron Age? Yeah, dive into the bog that is the Iron Age, which mm -hmm. is quite good because that's actually where the iron comes from spoilers yeah. <laughs> um so yes the iron age we're talking about 500 bce to around 800 ce and the period as you could expect is split into a few sub periods mm -hmm. and despite what i said last week this will actually be split into a couple of episodes because <laughs> there is actually a lot to talk about so yeah this kind of developed as we uh, as we went yeah the whole iron age is split into three sections which mm -hmm. are the pre-roman iron age from 500 bce up to the turn of the millennium then the roman iron age which is the first four centuries ce and then the germanic iron age which includes the migration period and the vendor era which is around 400 CE up until 800 CE. But because that one is so big and so complex, we're going to leave that until next week. 
um, with a lot of other stuff as well. But um, for now, this week, we'll just talk about the pre-Roman Iron Age and the Roman Iron yeah. Age. Exciting. Very exciting. Well, that sets us sort of where we are in, in time. But what is the Iron Age? Well, hence the name Iron becomes a thing now. We're not entirely sure how it reached Sweden, but probably through the immigration of the first smiths and the acquisition of technology via trade and contacts with abroad. But that's just the idea of Iron Age because... Either way, finally now, Sweden has all the raw raw material to do so. Unlike the Bronze Age, when there wasn't actually bronze in Sweden, now there are ore, which is the raw material for making iron, and wood to make the charcoal. So this metal had far more impact on the general population than bronze did. It was used for tools and weapons and remained the foundation of society for hundreds and thousands of years. Exciting. And it's very good that you could have all of that stuff centrally. So you're that not, is helpful. Yeah, you know, not paying all your sailors to go and just mm. get the iron itself. You can pay them to go and get more exciting mm. things. And also it's definitely right when it's saying it became the foundation of society for the foreseeable future, because thanks to iron, you could make better and stronger tools to use in everyday life. And it was more readily available. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to um, go to a lot of effort in importing it. And that led to better farming, better houses and all this kind of thing. And this improvement was actually really needed because at the start of this period, life actually got quite hard in Sweden as the climate changed and all of this stuff before it recovered and then what became a really thriving society at the end. We talked about already in the Bronze Age near the end of the episode that the climate was getting colder and by the time that we had reached the Iron Age, this climate change was really taking hold, which it is now. Yeah. This led to changes in the demography of Sweden during the Iron Age. Evidence indicates that as things got, to put it bluntly, colder and harsher, more people moved inland. And new areas were populated and people started farming more independently rather than in these large communities. And as Chris said, with better techniques and with better tools. And in many ways, we see how necessity is the mother of all inventions, because not only did they make better tools with the help of the introduction of the iron and also later steel, But we also see the first mills in Sweden popping up during this Mm. period, which had a huge impact on both farming and people's food intake. Ooh, yay! We can really start to refine that bread-making process now that we have mills for the flour. Tasty Mm. food, Mm. tasty bread. Bread, bread, bread. You do like Scandinavian bread. I, I like Scandinavian bread, rye bread, dark bread, so dense that you could use it to kill someone. That's what bread should be like. Yeah, as a brick, like a brick of bread. As this iron was so important for the everyday Swede at this point, what's the first evidence of them actually producing it? Well, the first iron objects were probably imported from the Celts. In fact, the word iron, or in Swedish, jan, comes from the Celtic languages. Uh, Then Sweden started making their own iron, because as, as we said, For once, now we actually have the raw material available. Mm -hmm. By building a furnace near a lake or a bog that had a lot of ore in it, you dig the ore out in spring and summer, and then you heat it up in the furnace, and the iron sinks to the bottom. That's a very, very simplified way of describing it. But the process is effectively the same today. And hopefully there were no owls in the bog when you were doing it. Yeah, because you don't want your... I didn't see that connection, actually. Yeah, oh, we're back yeah. in the bog. As we've seen with so many things in ancient Sweden over these last few episodes, the knowledge of iron making came from Denmark, where so many things came from. And it was introduced first uh, to the south of Sweden, before then gradually spreading across the country. Great. So that's an overview of the whole Iron Age. Mm -hmm. Um, As we said, we don't really have time to talk about all three of the periods this week. So we'll just start with looking at the first two, which are the two Roman-related Iron Ages, I guess. Yeah. Take it away, Chris. 
pre-Roman Iron Age. We start this period in about 500 BCE and it goes all the way up to 1 CE. So it's a long period of about 500 years. And this period involves quite a big change in the way society was structured. One author I read even says that Sweden and its Nordic neighbours were the backwater of Europe. Oh, that's harsh. It's quite a shame, really. And this is why I said in the last episode that this episode might be a bit boring and not a lot to talk about, because I thought we would probably just do an episode just on this period, but we're extending into the future Mm. as well. So this is called this period where like the missing Iron Age or the age of no finds, because there isn't really much there to talk about. There is a lack of archaeological finds. And agriculture became pretty much the foundation of the society. And so it seems like there was this backward step that society made at the time. Its burials became much simpler with much fewer finds, so less record to talk about. And there was hardly any grave goods to Mm. analyse. The trade and contact with the richer Mediterranean region that we talked about so much last few episodes and how great it became, (laughs) it just dried up as... The more Celtic cultures took hold across Central Europe and they weren't necessarily as interested in being involved in this huge network. They were sort of dealing with themselves. So there was a bit of a geographical Mm. gap between Sweden and the more wealthy Mediterranean regions. Mm. And as a result of that, importation of bronze almost completely stopped. But the local iron production did start. So that's good. This production of iron didn't really kickstart, though. There wasn't a huge explosion and everybody was just making everything out of iron just for the sake of it. It started off quite slowly and built up as we go. And there still isn't that much of it found in the record, even at this point. Yeah, the big changes in this period was how different sections of society started losing part of their purpose It's suggested that after the warrior and trading chieftains of the Bronze Age, these upper classes began to melt away and just became part of the general masses again. If they weren't able to bring in new goods from abroad and travel to make new contacts, then there was less reason for them to be seen as the number one in the local area. And so you could say that most parts of Social stratification in Swedish society ended as communities drifted a little bit backwards towards that back. Well, I don't like that word backwater. I don't think that's fair on on us, but uh, fair enough. We actually ended up with small egalitarian farming areas forming because through the lack of of trade and contact and new goods being brought in, society actually became more equal. Yeah, which is good in many ways, I think. But it also meant that people started grouping together a bit more and that meant farming was Mm. refined as everybody was... Their their only job was to deal with the farming. They weren't sailing to Britain and getting all this stuff as much. This started off with small villages and a small number of farms Mm. and... Everyday life might have been a bit harder, especially for those former elites used to traveling around and living the life. But it was actually better organized in terms of the farming and possibly not even poorer day to day life for the majority of people. So everyone was helping out. It was a bit like the Neolithic peoples, just a bit more organized now. And farming did improve in quite a number of ways. This was funny enough because of the worsening climate. So the winters became to become so harsh that all their cattle and animals had to be kept inside during the colder months. Mm -hmm. Because before, previously, it was so warm, they could just stay out in December and January. So we get the kind of farming that we still have today, where we keep our animals indoors. Yep. And what do animals do a lot of? Poop. Yep. So when they're being kept inside for four or five months of the year, this led to a huge pile of manure. Ew. Yep. Growing. And that wasn't really a thing up until now. Um, It wasn't managed as a procedure of manuring the land. The pooping wasn't controlled. No. Mm. So once you got to the warmer months, it was time to spread all this lovely heap of manure around your fields. And that obviously led to nicer and more productive Ah. fields. And the communities systematically used up all their winter manure supplies. Ah, that's... Wow, I've I've never really thought, thought of that. It's sort of... 
unintended consequences. Yeah. It's, we have to keep the animals inside, otherwise they'll die. But also, they're giving this this great poop supply yeah. that we can use later. That's that's extraordinary. Another thing to mention was the fact that the fields themselves didn't seem to have any real separation or formal boundaries in this time. Uh, this is particularly important when you talk about cattle, as they like to just walk about and uh, do their own thing and not stick to rules. Uh, and this has led to the suggestion that maybe cattle was like communally owned during this part of the Iron Age and not belonging to one specific family. The cold also uh, led to people even having to resort to wearing trousers now. We get the introduction of trousers because of the snow and the general cold weather. Oh, the horror. Yeah, oh, the trousers, or, or pants if you're American. The trousers have been introduced in history. Anyway, the cattle, of course, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, also shared these long homes, uh, at least helping the people to stay warm at night. I mean, if you've ever slept next to a cow, they're, they're pretty cozy. They're like a 250 kilo hot water bottle. Have you? Uh, no. <laughs> you, you spoke as if from experience. Well, uh, that's for me to know and for you to <laughs> never find out. I've never slept next to a cat. That wasn't the case in all of the villages. Some mm. of them do seem to have small barns mm. that um, they would have perhaps kept the more poopy animals in. Well, it's um, up to you, really. Do you want to have your cow next to you in bed or do you want to have your cow in a separate house? I mean, we're all, <laughs> we're all different. But when you're looking at the evidence for this period, the graves surrounding these small communities really show the depths to which these people had fallen in mm. terms of material wealth because the graves are pretty similar. Mm. There's a big decrease in grave goods when compared to the height of the Bronze Age and the dead weren't taken miles mm. and miles to religious centres or put in these huge ceremonial mounds like the King's Grave we talked about last time. They were very simple, very plain flat pack type burials oh. i guess a bit similar to modern day burials in the oh. sense that yeah most most graves now are are very similar you're not buried with your motorbike and your baseball bat and your laptop or something which is the equivalent of what these people true, were being buried true. in at in least, the bronze age at so. least in in our uh, culture yes. we should we should say uh, there are still cultures where you do have elaborate grave goods and that's very uh, true things like that but yeah no we get in in that sense something that's uh, similar to modern times which is interesting mm. but and, and that sort of wraps up the yeah. pre-roman iron age it's it's a more neolithic style of living in terms of community mm. and lack of specialisms and things, but also more, you've got iron and what you are actually doing is you're doing it a little bit better. Yeah, so. it's not necessarily a step backwards in that sense. because you're sideways. Also, yeah, you get developments like the manuring and uh, yeah, so it's a step sideways. But should you take us into the next period, which I know you're excited about? Yeah. Roman Iron Age. So this is where the fun really begins, because I heart the Romans. In this period, society started to look a bit more like the Bronze Age again, in terms of uh, luxury goods, complex cultural practices and organisations. So we've sort of taken slide to the left and then slide to the right. You've gone sideways and now you come back again to continue mm. that journey forwards like in a scottish kaylee dance yeah i was thinking of that was it called the cha-cha slide the song slide to the left slide to the right I two hops now i do, I <laughs> yeah, that one. don't don't know <laughs> you must have been to a club where they played that song no, well, the you... macarena that's it is it the macarena no the macarena no. is no. Na, 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 yeah, yeah, no. Eh. It's Cha Cha Slide. Is it the Cha Cha Slide? We'll YouTube it after yeah. we've finished recording. Now, um, please get back to the Roman Iron Age. <laughs> yes. So, in terms of a Swedish context, the Roman Iron Age began at the turn of the millennium. Mm -hmm. Rome had been expanding significantly in the last century of the previous millennium as mm -hmm. a succession of generals and provincial governors rewrote the scope of Roman Imperium. Mm -hmm. 
which is sort of Roman political power. Yeah. By the time the dust, or probably the screams, settled on the infamous Battle of Teutoburg Forest in 9 CE, the formal limit of Roman power fell away at the Rhine River, and they gave up trying to expand. The Rhine is our border. Rome still projected power and influenced people across these barbarian provinces in a way that wasn't done through provinces, governors, military outposts, and taxes. Perhaps the most important way they did this was through trade. Hmm. Scandinavia was no exception to this expansion in trade with the Romans, and Roman goods, culture, customs, and traders popped up in Germany, and by extension, all the way up through to Scandinavia. Mm. Roman culture certainly didn't just dissipate into the Rhine and stop going anywhere else. At this point, imports of Roman artifacts increased significantly in Sweden. There were one or two very, very random examples before this period, um, but this is where it really kickstarts and goes into overdrive. The Rhine and the Danube rivers were super highways of trade across Europe, and Sweden absolutely shared in this trade. A staggering array of goods made its way to Sweden at this time, including glass, ceramics, metalwork, textiles, and snazzy Roman coins. Mm. The Swedes gave away, again, almost exactly like the Bronze Age, furs, hides, horses and slaves Mm. which the ambitious roman entrepreneurial traders lapped up and took back to romanized gaul and beyond the bronze age trade networks of the mediterranean and central europe were replaced by a more closer local trading partnership but one that looked very similar to the bronze age Mm. the swedes didn't need to travel as far or connect into a longer network because the the romans were much closer than crete say By the time we get to the reign of Hadrian, the first bearded emperor, fun fact, in the early part of the 2nd century CE, Scandinavians and Swedes were drinking from Roman mass-produced bronze cups and vessels, and they were identical to the ones that were found in Pompeii after it was destroyed by the eruption in 79 CE. The coloured glass, which was made from German factories in the empire, also found its way up to Scandinavia and there's one place that I've forgotten the name of that was sort of like the big trading hub on the Rhine or the Danube which is where all the Romans went it was a big shopping center basically for Romans and they spread everything out from there agricultural practices also spread northward and in this time of Hadrian Roman ideas of farming had begun to be adopted in Sweden too so The fields themselves were becoming even more organized and the Swedes started to build permanent field boundaries made out of stone, so separating the fields into easily manageable rectangles. Again, kind of like what farming looks like today. Iron-made plows also meant that heavier soil could be planted with rye becoming a favourite. For that rye bread. For that rye bread. Still is a favourite in Scandinavia. Uh, If you can't kill someone with a loaf of bread, it's not a good loaf of bread. So rye was becoming a favourite. It was finally time to rein in those pesky cattle that were previously roaming everywhere as they were put into strict family-run fields to be owned by one group in the village and not owned by the community at large. Hilda, stop pooping in the Svensson's field. You have to come and poop in our field now. <laughs> because you, we own your manure. Yeah, you're our cow, not their cow now. Come and poop here. <laughs> this the slow creep back into the stratified society of the Bronze Age led to most villages having at least one family or farm that was larger than the rest, just... You know, the Svensons did better than the Jakobsons and the Pettersons. You know, that's kind of the natural way of things and showcasing their heightened economic power. And these locals were taking advantage of this long distance trade network to build up their own position in society. Exactly like the Bronze Age. Yeah. Therefore, it can be said that Roman luxury vessels were in demand in southern Scandinavia for social and political reasons. These prestige goods were a way to visualize power within the Scandinavian community, a bit like the rock art was uh, in the episode last week, 
where we talked about Bronze Age chieftains sailing to Europe, getting great goods, and then writing or drawing about it later. Yeah, very similar. More evidence of these leading families come from the increasingly extravagant graves. So we're back to schnazier graves with the bodies being buried with a wide range of Roman goods, including weapons, bronze drinking cups and gold jewellery. And like most of these things, it didn't take long for the Swedish metal workers and other artisans to get influenced by the Romans too. They thought, this stuff's great, I'm going to copy it. And the main productivity concentrated on the sort of area around Stockholm, the place we mentioned a lot, Lake Mälaren, and also absolutely massively on the islands of Erland and Gotland. This is where the Swedish metal workers and, and other tradesmen really started to shine and build their own tapestry of mm. history by using the techniques and the styles of the Romans, but twisting them and mm. definitely making them very Swedish. It has been suggested, and this is one that sort of a lot of the articles that I've read, half of them definitely think this is a good idea and some hate the idea, but it's suggested that quite a few Swedes might have gone south to fight in the Roman military because at this point the... Roman military really relied on a lot of foreigners to fight in their army to fight the other foreigners. So I think it's accept it's definitely accepted that Swedes would have done this, but they wouldn't there's arguments about whether or not they returned as like the conquering hero with five wagons worth of all this Roman stuff, and that's how the Roman stuff got to mm. their communities. It's they more likely would have been just a normal grunt and came back, they were lucky to be alive, uh, mm. but brought back a few Roman ideas, but not wagons full of stuff that yeah. they've stolen. And in the end, it's it's the ideas and the introduction of new ideas that drive change in society, and it's always been, so... Yeah, exactly. And one of the consequences of this is you start seeing the ideas around politics coming in a lot more. So they would have come back with goods and wealth and stuff, but perhaps the most important commodity was these ideas of political power, centralising the wealth and the power, and violent or political ways of getting things done. Yeah, and this is also the time when we start to get the first written mention of Sweden and sources from abroad, so that's quite exciting. The rest of the world has started to notice our existence, We'll talk more about that next time because I know Chris is excited to talk about something else right now. Romans. Yay! This is the age of the Romans and Chris could talk about this forever. Yes, Roman period is probably the, my favourite period of history. Mm. I did it at, before university, at what Americans would call high school, what we call college very confusing for Americans, I think that. So I did at college. In, in British colleges, you choose four subjects. And I did classical civilizations, early modern history, archaeology, and geography. <laughs> and I remember when I was sitting down, sort of like the interview before you go to the place where you pick your subjects, the person said to me, it's like, three of your four subjects are very focused on really old history and it's like yep because i want to do roman history at university and that's what i did you did um yes. but i won't give you a, a talk about roman history because there are much more qualified people than me but also many more podcasts which you should listen to um particularly the partial historians totalis rankium the emperor's series uh, obviously it's like mike duncan's history of rome the history of Byzantium and life of Caesar, which morphed into the life of Augustus, life of Tiberius, and now life of Caligula. Listen to all of those. They are great. But like we do in these sections, looking at other parts of the world give you an indication of what Sweden was mm. like at the time. It can definitely be seen from Roman records that the Swedes at the time were not just traders, but also engaged in piracy. Um, so I'll give you a brief quote here. A more complicated example of this type of seaborne piracy is the pirate tactics employed by the Franks, Goths, and other barbarians in the 3rd century CE. The raids themselves were varied in both style and scale. This led to the sea having greater numbers on it than ever before, put together by the Herulians. 
In the final engagement against the Herulean pirate fleet, the Roman fleet sank 2,000 ships, according to Zosimus. And as we said, the Herulians were possible name for people in South Sweden and South Scandinavia at the oh. time. And that was a quote from my dissertation or thesis from my <laughs> undergrad degree. Oh, um, how which, nice that that got a yes, mention. Yes, I've quoted myself, which Maybe was... Maybe in a, like a hundred episodes, if we ever talk about drones, I can quote my, my yeah. undergrad dissertation because that's what I did mine on. Yeah, my dissertation was piracy in the Roman world, a social, military and political problem. So Romans dealt with a lot of pirates at the time, mm-hmm. and a lot of them were barbarian pirates, <gasps> which by extension were the yeah the coming from the general area of Sweden mm-hmm. and northern Europe. And we've recruited uh, one of my friends from school, a uh, long-time friend, who is a, an actor who is currently serving his quarantine period overseas, so he's not doing any acting. And um, we've asked him to read out two quotes for us because they're quite long, but they talk about what pirates would have been doing in this time and what the Romans would have been doing to stop them. So we start with a quote from a Roman poet, diplomat and bishop. That's quite a cool career. Yeah. Called Sidonius Apollinaris. And he's talking about what the pirates did and how they would attack Roman shipping. He attacks unforeseen, and when foreseen, he slips away. He despises those who bar his way, and he destroys those whom he catches unawares. If he pursues, he intercepts. If he flees, he escapes. A storm, whenever it occurs, lulls into a false sense of security the object of their attack, and prevents the coming attack from being observed by victims. They gladly endure dangers amid waves and jagged rocks in the hope of achieving a surprise. So that's quite exciting. The pirates attacking sneakily and yeah. getting their victims and using surprise and talking about how they would even go during huge storms and stuff at the end. Sneaky, sneaky, potentially Scandinavian pirates. Yeah. So that was from the middle of the 400 CE and also roughly at that time, more in the 4th century, so in the 300s, we have a bit from Vegetius's Epitome of Military Science, which was a guy who was a Roman writer during the 300s, and we don't really know anything about him, but he seems to be writing this book about Roman military science, um, possibly for the emperor, and he gives a huge description. It's four books on how the Roman military and navy worked. And so this is how the Roman navy attacked and dealt with pirates. To the larger warships are attached scouting skiffs, having about 20 oarsmen on each side. These the Britons call picketty. They are used on occasion to perform chases, or to intercept convoys of enemy shipping, or by studious surveillance to detect their approach or intentions. Lest scouting vessels be betrayed by white, the sails and rigging are dyed Venetian blue, which resembles the ocean waves. The wax used to pay ship's sides is also dyed. The sailors and marines put on Venetian blue uniforms too, so as to lie hidden with great ease when scouting by day as by night. So this is what I used in my dissertation a lot. So the bit at the end... Because the pirate ships were so much faster than the Roman ships. Romans had to, I called them James Bond boats when I talk about them because Mm. they're very cool. So they're basically, they're painting everything on their ship blue so the pirates can't see them. They're just sitting there in the middle of the the sea waiting Mm. for the pirates to come up and then they would signal (gasps) the, the Roman fleet and be like, there are pirates coming, quick, stop them. This is very cool. That is cool. And those quotes were, as Chris said, read out by our good friend, the actor Matthew Winters. So thank you so much for that, Matthew. You might hear his voice again. Yep, that would be exciting. So what we've learned from that brief bit about Roman piracy was that these were the sort of methods that the Swedes would have been doing if they weren't being happy and nice and trading and had to deal with all the drama llama that was going out on the sea. So it wasn't all fun for the traders going up to Scandinavia. Definitely not. So we've covered a lot in these episodes about the Iron Age. 
to sort of help you place it in history, you can think of the Romans and everything we know about the Roman Empire and that that was broadly going on at the same time. If if you'd like a little, just, just a handy tool to pinpoint where we are uh, in the timeline of history. And speaking of history, I guess this episode is now done. Yeah, this episode is now history, uh, but we'll be coming back in two weeks uh, with more on the Iron Age. Yep, as we finished the pre-Roman Iron Age and the Roman Iron Age, we now need to continue the story into the Vendal and Migration era and see what happens right before the Vikings turn up. But don't switch off just yet. Uh, listen, after the outro music, uh, we kept a little blooper in uh, for you from uh, our recording session. Yep, so if you want to listen to something funny, stay on to the very end. Um, but for now, I think just... A regular shout out to everybody on Twitter who have been contacting us on at Flatpack Sweden and on Facebook. Yeah. Just search our name and please do leave some reviews. We've had our first few iTunes reviews and once we get a few more, we'll start to name check people and read them out. So. Yeah. Thank, thank you that uh, those reviews help us being uh, getting noticed. So, uh, But until next time, it's goodbye. Hey, do staggering array of goods made its way to Sweden, including grass. Um, <laughs> a staggering array. I think we had grass before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>